All right, guys, today we're going to be, uh, be reacting to the second part of this video. Uh, we already reacted to the first one. We're going to simply just jump in and just move to the second part. Some of you guys were just disagreeing with some of the commentary that I was just giving. Um, some of you guys were saying that, no, no, I don't get to any conclusions. Uh, uh, yet, just watch the video and then you can just give it a conclusion or your opinion. Okay, so let's see. Uh, that's what I'm going to do. Next up is healthcare, and it's a big one. Wealthy countries, including the US, tend to spend more per person on healthcare and related expenses than lower income countries. However, even as a high income country, <clears throat> the US spends more per person on healthcare than comparable countries. Yet, despite the crushing effect that these costs have on American lives, the U.S. is the only industrialized nation without universal health insurance. The Kaiser Family Foundation estimates that the country's collective medical debt is almost $200 billion. And again, guys, yeah. I feel like this goes without saying, but this video is already long enough, so there's really no feasible way that I could comprehensively cover the difference between public and private health care in both the U.S. and Germany. But we've dedicated two videos to breaking this down in detail, giving real world examples. So if you want to learn more, please click the links down in the description of this video. Now, as I mentioned earlier, for the single workers and the family of workers in Germany, well, they've already prepaid their healthcare costs. So if we're going to do a fair and balanced comparison, it's only right that I do my best to try to estimate these costs okay. for Steve no and Steve and Stephanie's family in the United States. And because the majority of Americans are not actually enrolled in Medicare or Medicaid, but actually participate in the private healthcare system, I'm going to be using this as the benchmark for this analysis. When I worked for an American university, I was enrolled with a PPO plan through Blue Cross Blue Shield of Kansas City. And although the copy of my HR briefing book is from 2014, I'm gonna use it because it's a real world example of the costs associated with healthcare. And really, it was a pretty good plan as far as American coverage and cost is concerned. So again, watch the video in the description if you'd like a full explanation. But that being said, the dollar has had an average inflation rate of 2.91% per year between 2014 and today, producing a cumulative price increase of just over 25%. So I'm going to take those costs from 2014 and increase them by 25% to be balanced. Okay, so assuming Steve was offered the same PPO plan through Blue Cross Blue Shield at his engineering firm, adjusted for inflation, his rates for his premium are actually really pretty low at just $55 a month. But from there, there's a lot of factors that could change his financial situation. With this plan, Steve would need to hit a deductible of approximately $3,100 before his insurance even Pick paid 10. just 80% of the costs. And this is all assuming that the yeah, doctors- That's before the, the, um, the entire cover kicks in, yeah? He sees are in network. But you know, he's a 23 year old guy. I'm gonna give him the benefit of the doubt that he's probably a pretty healthy dude. And he's probably only going to see the doctor once a year and the dentist twice a year for his regular checkups. And he's only paying probably 40 bucks a pop and a copay in order to go see them. In the end, between the premiums and these copays, it's not a huge hit to his disposable income. It's only about $780 in total, but I'll take it out because again, we're trying to be fair here. Now, for families in the U.S. with private health care, things get quite a bit more expensive. So, let's take a look. Under the same PPO plan with inflation, a family health insurance premium would cost roughly $910.50 every month. That Under this plan, right. should they have right. any medical needs, they would need to have a deductible to hit first which is approximately $1,250 before insurance began to pay 80% of the costs. Then a yearly out-of-pocket maximum of approximately $7,000 before 100% of the costs are covered. That's crazy. But again, you know, making these kinds of calculations is ultimately really, really tough because we have four people here to account for. If they're healthy and they're only going to just their regular doctor's checkups, you know, they might just have that premium and a copay here or there to worry about. 
But if they get into an accident, if anyone happens to become ill or disabled, it can radically change your financial situation. According to the Commonwealth Fund, the median yearly household spending and out-of-pocket costs in the state of Colorado in 2017 was $1,150. So if we take this amount, plus 12 months of a $910.50 premium, which totals just under $11,000, we get a total of $12,076 in healthcare costs, reducing their disposable income to $144,762 and a monthly take-home pay of $12,063.50. Uh, I mean, good points there. Yeah, very complicated, the private sector, how they handle the copay. It all, it all depends state by state. If you live in New York City, oof, they will, don't make you visit the doctor every week. Yeah. Next up is unemployment insurance. And in the United States, all of the U.S. states, with the exception of Montana, are what are termed at-will employment. Most do have exceptions, but the states of Florida, Alabama, Louisiana, Georgia, Nebraska, Maine, New York, and Rhode Island do not follow any exceptions. And essentially, what at-will employment means is that an employer can terminate an employee for no reason, except an illegal one, or for no reason without incurring legal liability. Okay. At will also means that an employer can change the terms of employment relationship with no notice and no consequences. In contrast, there are significant worker protections here in Germany. Someday, I think it would be super interesting to make a video on this subject because quite frankly, it is very difficult to lose. Well, it's becoming very hard to even fire a person right now in the United States because HR departments are very on top of those things. However, I'll make, I'll make some distinction here. It is very common, you know, post COVID-19, if you were working for home, if they needed to fire you, they'll fire you. I, because that's what happened to me. I was working for home for a company, and they said that, you know, we were, you just wanted to terminate the remote position. If you relocate, to this state, well, maybe we can think about, you know, well, I'm not giving you the position. It was very bad, so she has a point. Lose your job here in Germany. And, and even if you did lose your job, because maybe your position happened to be eliminated altogether, Germans still benefit from a continuation of healthcare coverage and actually pretty generous unemployment insurance as well. In short, you will benefit from 60% of your previous average wage, or 67% if you have children, up to a maximum of 7,050 euros per month in West Germany and 6,750 euros in East Germany. Now, the US Department of Labor does have an unemployment program. But to be honest, it's not much. Uh, if you're looking at a single worker like Steve or a family man like Steve who actually has a much higher wage, in total, they're probably gonna get anywhere from like 240 to 450 bucks a week, which yeah, ultimately ends up being around 15% of their wages. Yeah, really so since unemployment low. insurance is one of those things- Very that low, very disrespectful, I think. Very low, very low. It all depends how much, of, especially in the state of Wisconsin, if you get fired and let's say you apply for unemployment, I mean, it's so low. We're talking about 150 to 110 dollars a week. It's that Germans actually pay for through social contributions. Again, it's only fair that we presume that both single Steve and family man Steve are paying into some kind of safety net in the event that they happen to lose their job. The only problem is, is that these type of supplemental insurance policy plans, 
don't really exist in the United States. Mm. So honestly, the best protection is to build up a robust emergency fund through savings. But that's something that's easier said than done. It was reported in 2020 by the Federal Reserve that 37% of Americans would not be able to pay a $400 emergency expense without either borrowing money wow. or selling something. But fair is, is fair. It's a lot. <laughs> in Germany, unemployment insurance totals 1.2% of your gross income. And while saving just a little over 1% of your income every month isn't exactly going to build up your savings quickly. It's something. And again, I'm doing my best to be fair and balanced here. So for our US single Steve, this is going to reduce. I'm trying my best to be fair and balanced. Just present the facts. Use his take home yeah, pay. By it, just present the facts. I think the best thing you can do in a video like this is just present the facts. Don't don't try to be fair and balanced. If it sounds bad in one side, let it be. If it sounds good in another side, let it be. Okay, I think that does. I like facts. If the facts are, cr are, are cruel and raw, let it be. I $1,052 and bring down his disposable income to $60,739. For the family, 1.2% of their gross cumulative income is $1,838.48, which will bring down their disposable income to $142,923.52. Okay, let's go. Now, along the same lines of unemployment insurance, Germans also pay social contributions into long-term care insurance, which compensates you for loss of income and the cost of long-term nursing care, whether due to an accident, illness, or old age. And what is really cool about this system is that it's not just to help compensate for the cost of a traditional nursing home. It can also help pay for the wages of a loved one to take care of you at home. That's so if nice. you're a parent and one of your children develops a chronic illness or a long-term disability, this can also be used to help pay you as their caregiver. Yeah, it's pretty fabulous actually. And to be honest, it makes this kind of comparison super difficult because this isn't something that generally exists in the United States. So as the American population ages, more and more are taking out private long-term care insurance that is somewhat similar to Germany's, covering many types of long-term care, including both skilled and non-skilled care, and some may even include coverage for a range of services like adult daycare, assisted living, medical equipment, and informal home care. Now, finding a quote for these type of plans online is actually kind of difficult because many of the estimated costs, well, they start for people who are looking for this type of insurance at the age of 55 and older. Oh, okay. Not exactly something that a 23-year-old is looking to invest in, per se. According to the American Association for Long-Term Care Insurance and their 2022 data and statistics report, a basic yearly premium for a 55-year-old healthy single male is $950, and a single female at the same age is $1,500. Jump mm. just five years, and that plan is now $1,175 for a 60-year-old male and $1,900 for a 60-year-old female. In other words, this shows about a 20% increase every five years. So if I work backwards, taking a 20% regression every five years on the premium, single worker Steve could expect a yearly premium of just under 250 bucks and the family just under a thousand dollars a year to insure both partners. Pension basis, social security, my social security. I mean, we're just wasting so much money. You know what, I'm in favor of social security. Um, I think, you know, there was an agreement between private citizens and the government to just create like a savings account so when they retire, that money will be in. And actually, the, it makes sense uh, because for every dollar that you put in, in the government is taking 17%. The problem is that somehow that money just disappeared. I mean... I don't like my social security system because it's just, we failed. We failed uh, the people that put money in it, so.
In Germany, the statutory pension insurance benefit, or the Gesetzliche Rentenversicherung, is paid out to individuals from retirement age and provides basic payments of around 70% of your working net income. In contrast, the U.S. Social Security replacement rate is around 40%. However, that proportion can vary widely depending on how much you earned during your working years. And now this replacement rate, quite frankly, shouldn't be surprising. The fact that Germans get about 70% of their income and Americans only 40% because Germans actually pay more into this state-funded pension system than their American counterparts do into Social Security. In Germany, everyone must contribute 18.6%, half by their employer and half by themselves, each bearing 9.3% of their net salary, okay. up to a maximum contribution ceiling of 7,050 euros in the West and 6,750 euros in the Eastern German states. In contrast, in the United States, everyone must only contribute 12.4%. This is again shared half and half by the employers and the employees, meaning that each only pays 6.2% of their wages up to the taxable maximum of $147,000 dollars of yearly income in 2022. Hmm. Now there are a litany of retirement programs out there from 401ks to Roth IRAs. And honestly, even how much you choose to contribute to these plans is variable. So to be fair and transparent, um, I'm only gonna ask that the American workers contribute to an additional 3.1% of their gross income to retirement. Because again, that 3.1% is the difference between what Germans pay into the state pension and what Americans pay as a percent of their income into social security. Mm -hmm. um, I'll calculate this as a 401k because this is the most common type of employer-sponsored retirement plan in the US and it helps with tax deductions. So for single worker Steve, 3.1% of his gross income of $87,676 amounts to $2,717.96. Okay. However, as a 401k, this reduces his taxable income. And it ultimately means that he only has $1,891 less each year in disposable Damn. income. Now for the family, 3.1% of their joint income amounts to just under seven grand. But again, if I structure this as a 401k, it reduces their taxable income and only ultimately means that they see a reduction of just under $5,000 each year in their disposable income. All right, guys, so we're actually down to the final category. Really? And for yeah. some of you, this last category might seem like a little bit of a curveball. Child care costs aren't something that is directly listed on the social contributions. But just like higher education, it's nonetheless part of the socialized system here. Because in Germany, the holistic education and upbringing of your child is a community endeavor. So it makes sense that community funds should be used for it. This thinking has caught on somewhat in the United States. Well, there are already four states in the US with free pre-K for three and four year olds. There actually was a big push last year under the Biden administration to try to pass a bill guaranteeing free pre-K nationwide. Pre, 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 Ultimately, pre this push for universal pre-K did fail. It didn't make it into the bill. But it's the first time in my memory that the nation has collectively thought about even passing something remotely similar to what we have here in Germany. Nonetheless, for this comparison, you know, our single workers don't have kids, so it doesn't really change their finances any. But for our families, the difference in paying for childcare and not having to pay for childcare makes a, a huge, huge impact. Yeah. In the United States, you can pay over $1,100 on child care, and child care a month, $1,200. On your take-home pay and your disposable income every month. So, for example, should Max and Mila and their two children be located in Berlin, for example, Berlin. Uh, Kita, which is for smaller children, and Kindergarten is completely free. The only thing they would have to pay for is about 24 bucks a month per child for food, Not bad. Which, which is practically nothing. It's pretty incredible. In addition, they're collecting something called Kindergeld. At 250 euros a month 
per child until the age of 18. Our German family receives 500 euros every month, tax-free, to help offset the costs of raising little wow. ones. On the flip side of things, Steve and Stephanie also have two small children, one in daycare and the other in pre-K. For full-time, full-day daycare in Denver, the average cost is $1,575 per month. For pre-K, the costs are slightly less, but quite honestly, not much, as the average cost is $1,539 per month for, again, full-time, full-day programs. To be fair, if your two kids go to the same facility, these companies will often offer what they term a sibling discount. In Denver, the sibling discount ranged from 5 to 50%, but most commonly, the source I used, which actually analyzed the pre-K and daycare God rates damn, bro, all the way so down expensive. by the differences in zip code and neighborhood, saw that a 10% reduction was pretty much the standard rate for a second child. So we could safely presume that our American family in Denver is paying a whopping $2,956.50 per month in childcare alone. That's a lot. Spread that out over 12 months, and guys, you can see the dramatic effect. It reduces their disposable income by $35,478. Yeah. Chrissy, that's a salary that I don't, that's why I don't use daycare. All my kids are just uh, raised at home. Um, I'm the only one that works. My wife takes care of the kids. We don't need to do the health uh, child care because of that reason. And I think those numbers were kind of way too high because it, at least I thought it was going to be a little bit lower. $800 to $1,200 uh, $1, uh, a month, but those numbers were way too high, way too high, way too high. But of course, you're just saying in Denver, which is a city. But, you know, a lot of, I will say more than half of the Americans, they don't use um, uh, child care because of that same reason. They just, they, they figure out. In my case, all my kids are at home. Uh, they, we don't sell them to child care. So. so that would not even come to mind because we know the numbers. <laughs> All right, guys, so if you're still here in this video and you don't yet have a headache from all of the numbers, I'm here to share with you the final results. As a single worker, at the end of all of the calculations, well, Steve is still significantly better off. Yes, that's, that's how I expected in the beginning. Probably gonna be a little bit more, but when you put things into perspective, it's almost the same, to be honest. That's what I expected. In terms of income. So even when we adjust things here for the exchange rate, yeah. As a single worker in your early 20s in this particular profession, things were quite a bit better in the United States in terms of money. On the flip side of things, the families saw a much, much closer final outcome. So when adjusted for the currency exchange rate as of today, Max and Nila I'm gonna throw a curveball. What if she didn't go to work? What if she didn't go to work? He's already making 150 something thousand dollars. What if he didn't go to work? That's almost half, uh, that's almost 75% of her salary. 35,000, she, she was earning what, 60,000? I think it was 60,000, 68. Yeah. They put that 35,000 something back into the equation. I think she's putting the perspective of what she think could be the average, but I don't, I don't. That childcare, I would not even pay for that, man. That's crazy. I think that's, I would like to know more about those numbers. What if she, the woman didn't, because he already earning 150 something thousand dollars. And think about it, she's earning $60,000, right? And then you pay 35000 it's like, you see what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's a lot of money, it's wasted. Actually had just over a thousand 
more dollars, if that's the currency we're using, in disposable income. So yeah, it, it's a pretty tight margin for sure. But technically speaking, the German family did come out ahead of the American family. But here's what's so interesting. Again, I spoke earlier in this video about exchange rates and how they can fluctuate. So if we were to go just two years back in time when the Euro was quite a bit stronger than the American dollar, these dynamics changed dramatically. We would see an even greater difference in take home pay with the German family coming out even further ahead than the American family. And quite frankly, has around 15 years of experience and she brings in 68,000 right here right the 68,000 right so 35,000 right he's making already 150,000 154,000 right she's making 68,000 hear me out hear me out what if what if Because we're not even, you know what's crazy about this? We're not even taking into account cars, payments, car insurance payments, food, none of that stuff. You want to say, this right here might be, a, um, I always say this, the $68,000 that she's bringing might be a liability, in my opinion. And Steve, if the, if Steve really doesn't tough it up, this, the 68000 it is a liability for Steve. Crazy to think about, right? But because if you're spending almost two thousand dollars, more than two thousand, well, in this case, the way the, the way that you were saying it, almost three. Uh, yeah, it was what three thousand, almost three thousand dollars in childcare. That's insane, man. I, I, this is so far from my reality when it comes down to these kind of expenses. That even thinking about paying almost thirty-five thousand in childcare make no sense to me. It make no sense. No sense at all. Crazy. Steve better just tough it up, man, because that's way too much expenses. Way too much expenses. Wow. Interesting video. Very nice. You know. Oh, guys, let me know what you guys see in the comment section below. It'll be very interesting to see. I don't know. Is there any Americans here that, that might be in my same the same situation that I am? I don't pay for child care. Meaning, like, I don't pay for any child care because I know that's a, it's an expense that is not feasible. Stupid. It's almost a salary. It is a salary. There's people making thirty-five thousand dollars. There's people making twenty thousand dollars with two or three kids. Imagine paying thirty-five thousand dollars for childcare. Mm -mm. What? 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 Is, I think that that's childcare thingy. I don't know. You take that equation out, it'd be a different outcome because not. I don't know what's the if, whether it's the majority or not of Americans that put their kids in childcare, I don't know. All right, so here, roughly 27% of infant and toddler in the United States attends on some form of paid childcare. So it's not even a high, well, it is kind of high, it's 27%, but it's not a like majority, right? So I think that number in itself might be a little bit off, right? Some kind of uh, childcare, I'm assuming it's more what, um, home-based childcare, parents, center-based child. So I'm guessing this is childcare, right? Or Okay, so this is the 20% 20, 20 right here. Other, right? Oh, this is about, oh, let me see, primary childcare. Okay, so this is all, from the 27%, this is the, how do they divide that 27%, right? So the parents, so the parents, are considered to be daycare. Well, it is a kind of daycare. So I'm assuming more of this, right? Because this is parent, home-based childcare. So 
home-based child care would mean like you're paying somebody to take care of the kids, right, while you're at home kind of a thing, or you're sharing that with your grandma or aunties, right? Center-based care, so I'm guessing this is just sending your kids to a daycare. And then, of course, other. It might be like a school or something. I don't know. Interesting, right? But let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. It will be interesting to see what you guys think. I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.